The story you're about to hear was told to me in the strictest of confidence. Certain names, dates and locations may have been changed to protect that confidence. Events that feature in this story may be part of the public record. If you believe you recognise any of the people, places or events that feature in this story, I ask you not to reveal any information publicly, out of respect for the subject's right to remain anonymous. My name is David Paul Nixon, and this is the New Ghost Stories podcast, where we delve into the New Ghost Stories archive to hear witness accounts of the supernatural. Stories that could be delusions, lies, fantasies, or perhaps even the real thing. Just don't make your mind up until you've listened. Hello and welcome to the second season of the New Ghost Stories podcast where each month I revisit a case from my archive of ghost stories, collected from all corners of the UK over the last, I think it's 12 years now? It is kind of hard to keep track at this point. Though inevitably things have slowed with the pandemic, my case file recently passed the 400 mark. Though I should stress that those are 400 investigations I've modestly performed, Not all of them will go on to become fully-fledged new ghost stories. For those listening for the first time, the way it works is that when someone approaches me with an account of the supernatural, we sit and we talk and I assess whether I consider them to be credible. There are no obvious red flags of deceit or self-deception. If we get past this first step, then I open a case file. That's when we start to talk about corroborative evidence. What I want is for them to demonstrate to me that what they're telling me is the truth, at least as far as they know it. I want to know if they really lived at that address or travelled to that location, how long it really takes them to go from A to B, who saw them, do they still have the texts, emails, receipts and so on. This is all designed to establish whether the subject is really telling the truth, at least as far as they know it. There is no attempt to deliberately or accidentally mislead me. Now, it's beyond my means to establish proof of the supernatural, and I'll leave that job to others better equipped with more experience. What I try to do is to remove any question of dishonesty on the part of the subject. With those doubts removed, then we have to start asking the big questions. Could this account really be true as described? An actual, real, life-changing haunting? Or is this some kind of extreme delusion? a fantasy brought on by stress or illness or a false memory. I would argue that either conclusion raises interesting questions about what is real and how we might come to believe and experience that which seems to be impossible. For if these are not real encounters with ghosts, what has really happened? What truths are concealed within? These are not stories for people who like easy answers, who cannot stand ambiguity. Of these 400 cases, only a few have reached a point of completion where I had complete confidence in them to be published. The rest remain in my archive. There is a faint hope that further evidence might be located in future and they could get to be published. It's a faint hope, but it has happened before. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast, you will have heard me mention that I'm about to bring out a new collection of ghost stories or rather that I've been preparing to do that for probably quite a long time now. Finally, that collection is complete, and I'm getting ready to publish. New Ghost Stories Volume 3 is due out on the 8th of October. These eight new tales find men and women coming face to face with what they fear most, as their lives spiral out of control, from parents facing burnout to social media stars reaping what they sow. In these stories, the sins of the past always find their way back to haunt the present. If you'd like to check that out, just search New Ghost Stories Volume 3 at Amazon to pre-order it on ebook and paperback. Today's story is from that new collection. It's actually the first one in the new book. It contains what strikes me as a new kind of haunting. Your standard haunted house tale involves some taking ownership of a property for the first time and 
discovering something that definitely wasn't included on the survey. But in this case, we have someone who owned their home already, returning after a long period, having leased it to someone else, and finding in their absence that something has changed, something they can't quite describe, but which makes its presence known with each passing hour. It's a story that touches on a number of contemporary issues, like who has the right to live where, and who enjoys the privilege to come and go as they please. Whether this story really happened as the subject describes is a question I can't answer. All I can do is assure you that a great deal of what they describe certainly did happen, and there is evidence and witness statements to back that up. But whether what happened was really supernatural, that's what I will leave for you to decide. We begin now with New Ghost Stories Case 304. It's called Coming Home, and you'll be able to hear it in full, uninterrupted, after these promotional messages. The New Ghost Stories podcast is now on Patreon. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to support what I do, please consider making a per-episode donation. You'll also get access to some upcoming bonus content. Just visit patreon.com slash stories. Probably worth mentioning that the narrator of this story is female. I felt nervous putting the key in the lock. I'd been away for over a year. I was sweating, but that was probably from dragging the suitcases downstairs. Nothing seemed to be wrong. I could see inside the flat by peering through the frosted glass windows. They blurred things, obviously, but you could still see quite a lot. Like whether you had clothes on or not in the hall. I've always been glad that the postie leaves the mail upstairs. I turned the key. It turned smoothly with a few familiar clicks. So I pushed the door open. The air wasn't the same. It was a bit stale. You know how you never notice the smell of you in your own home? We can always smell someone else in theirs. The flat smelt like someone else. It smelt musty. It was a man's smell. I moved my suitcases into the hall and closed the door behind me. I took a look around, trying to see if anything was different. What state had they left the place in? They'd lived here for 18 months. There was going to be some new wear and tear. It's amazing all the little things you can remember. I could recall little dents to the skirting board and scuffs along the walls that had been there from before, and I could easily spot the ones that were new. We probably weren't going to go after their deposit. Unless there was really something wrong. Nothing jumped out at me straight away. It looked like they'd made a decent job of leaving the place clean. There was a little dust, but they'd been gone a couple of days now, so that was forgivable. The bedroom looked fine. There were no sheets on the bed, but the mattress protector was still there. One of my little suggestions. I was not going to sleep on other people's stains and dead skin. I opened up the closets. Just the hangers were there. They clanged about as I slid the doors open. Parked up in the back were Pedro's golf clubs, the one thing we couldn't fit in the garage, the one thing I wouldn't have minded disappearing. It was cold and very quiet. I moved into the living room and noticed the new carpet. Not so new now. About a month after they'd moved in, we'd had an email to say they'd broken a bottle of wine and basically ruined it. They apologised and said they'd pay for a replacement. We agreed, but it made us kind of nervous, them screwing up so soon. They didn't really have any references. They were first-time travellers from Australia. We got on pretty well and decided to take a chance on them. They sent us pictures of carpet samples to approve, then paid to have it fitted. Nothing else happened after that, which was a big relief. It looked darker now I was seeing it in person. We'd rather have had hard floors anyway, we just didn't have the money yet. It's a one-bed basement flat. The living room is long, so we have the sofa and TV at one end and the dining area at the other. I sat on the sofa and bounced up and down. It seemed okay comfy and familiar. 
There was a ring on the dining table that definitely wasn't there before. I think we'll forgive them for that. It's a cheap table anyway. We spent more on the sofa. They'd given the kitchen a basic clean. The oven was filthy. Was that too much to ask? Probably not, but I didn't want to be vindictive. And I couldn't remember if we cleaned it before they moved in. My phone vibrated. Pedro was calling. Hey, how's it going? Fine, thanks. I just got back. How's it looking? It's... fine. You don't sound so sure. It's good. I mean, nothing's really changed. It just feels different, you know? Oh, so? Just doesn't feel like our home. We've been gone a long time. Yeah, but it's like the atmosphere. I want to wear the place out. It's all stale and smells a bit like man. You don't like man smell? Only when deodorised, not their actual smell. You guys stink too much. Well, when I'm back next week, I'll run around a bit for you. Get a sweat on and get out my old spice. How's that sound? Super gross, but thanks. How's the weather? Frickin' cold. It's only September. It's almost October. It's England. It's like 12 degrees. That's the problem with airing the place out. That's not cold. You're close to the equator. You don't know what cold is now. If I can stand it, I'll open the windows for 20 minutes, then put the heating on. You want to put the heating on in September? Yes, I'm going to put the heating on in September. It's freezing. I'm not big and hairy like you. Well, you know how much I appreciate that, right? Yeah, you better. So you remember how to set the dial on the boiler? Yes, I remember. I'm just asking. I can handle the boiler, thank you. Pedro's very technical. A real nerd. He knows how everything works. So he thinks I don't know how anything works. This gets on my nerves real bad. What time is it in Thailand? Almost 4am. You didn't need to call me. I just wanted to make sure you're safe. I'm only flying back to England. I can manage. It's nice that he cares and wants to look after me, but it bugs me. I texted him to say I'd arrive. What else did he need to know? I tell him to get off the phone and get some sleep. All my winter clothes are in the garage. I wonder if I can pull some out without shifting tons of boxes. I open up the windows and go outside. It takes a while to move things around in the garage to get to my clothes. I pull out a bag of winter coats and carry them inside before freezing my ass off. I manage to set the boiler all by myself and then close the windows. Wrapping myself up warm, I head out to our favourite pizza place. I was gutted to find out it was gone. It was a Thai place now, ironically. I was pretty sure Thai food was never going to taste as good outside Thailand. Exhaustion was catching up with me. I went to the supermarket and got a microwave curry and a few other supplies. It was nice and warm when I got back. I didn't stay up long. I ate my chicken tikka and caught up with British TV. I sent my sister a text. I was looking forward to catching up and meeting my baby nephew. I thought I'd crash out pretty fast, but I couldn't really sleep. It might have been the jet lag. But you know that relief you get when you return home from a long journey? I wasn't getting that. Maybe it was because I'd been away so long. Somewhere else had started to feel like home. It could have been because the flat was still empty of stuff. The atmosphere is different. Your voice bounces off the walls. And that smell was still there. And it was still cold. I had to go back to the thermostat in the middle of the night. I guess it was just going to take time for me to get used to everything here again. Things were in different places than they were before, and some things were missing. When I wanted to make coffee in the morning, I couldn't find where they put the kettle. The teaspoons were mixed in with the other spoons. Then I couldn't find my favourite cereal bowl. I have a big bowl because I'm always starving when I wake up. The cupboard where we used to keep the cups now had saucepans in it, which didn't make any sense. You have your cups where your kettle is, right? But they put the kettle away, so maybe they didn't like hot drinks. Weirdos. 
I solved the cup and pan situation by quickly doing a swap. Then I had my breakfast. Two bowls of Rice Krispies. They must have broken my favourite bowl and thrown it away. Bastards. The broadband was disconnected. Also really annoying. Couldn't they have transferred it to us instead of cutting it off? I don't know. It was just one more thing to sort out. I was liking them less now. It was a classic overcast British day. I headed into town to sort out a new contract for my phone. I could tether that to my laptop to get online for now. Things had changed more than I expected. There were always parts of town that were run down, but there were even more shops covered in shutters and more businesses catering for the immigrant population. Nothing really wrong with that. I just wasn't sure we needed more shops selling halal meat and shiny furniture. Making it look worse by comparison with a new build springing up. There were fancy flats in this thing called a box park. This was some kind of trend where you built shops inside of shipping crates. I guess because it was too expensive to run a normal shop now. If I ever wanted vegan sherbet or a Hello Kitty dreamcatcher, I knew where to go. It was like one part of town was waiting to swallow the other. The new part would rise and the old part would die. Walking by an estate agent's, I noticed how much house prices had shot up. That would make Pedro happy. He said this was a good place to invest. I hadn't really wanted to move around here, because it was a bit of a dive. But everywhere gets to make a comeback, I suppose. Pedro was right again. I knew Pedro wanted kids eventually. I wasn't sold on the idea. At least not yet. Getting a one-bedroom basement apartment made it seem like he wasn't in any rush. I figured now we were both moving back, he might start asking again. He got so misty-eyed over pictures of Maxie's baby. How long before that conversation was going to come back up again? I checked the mail when I got back. There were a few letters for our old tenants in the cubby. I had no idea if we had their forwarding address. I wondered what had happened to our post. We must have had some while we were away. There was a lost cat poster on the wall. I didn't even know pets were allowed in the building. As I was reading it, the Puerto Rican lady who lives in the flat above walked by. She and Pedro would sometimes chat in Spanish. I was going to say hello, but she passed right by me. Perhaps she didn't notice me. I started to unpack in the afternoon and got back online, messaging friends and arranging catch-ups. Pedro called in the evening. He was staying five days more to finish his contract. Everything working? Seems to be. Did you master the boiler? It's working fine, I lied. Did Adam and Katie leave a forwarding address? Yeah, I think so. I'll forward you the email. Looks like they got some bills. Hope they paid for everything. They remembered to cancel the internet. I think they'll have taken care of them. No thanks to them for that. The 4G down here is terrible. I sent you some price comparison stuff to look at, by the way. There's no way Pedro would let me choose broadband on my own. He actually reads small print. He's literally the only person who ticks the little box and is being totally honest. What else you been up to? Unpacking. You been to the garage? Just for some clothes. Going to let me do all the heavy lifting, are you? He also has this thing about me leaving all the hard stuff to him, as if he'd let me do it anyway. No, I'll start bringing things in. You sure? Don't strain yourself. First you don't want me to leave you all the work. Now you want me to wait. Make your mind up, Pedro. I'm not trying to make you do anything. Do all you can and we'll take care of the rest together. Maxie just emailed me. Looks like she can get away tomorrow night. Get away? Don't you want to spend time with Baby? Yeah, of course. But I'm sure she's sick of the sight of him. Probably dying for a night out. I don't believe it. Babies are noisy, poopy, screamy, and they have absolutely no banter. But so cute. I was saved from talking about it more when the signal dropped out and didn't come back. I texted him goodnight and got myself ready for bed. I had trouble sleeping again. It wasn't just jet lag. I'd forgotten how noisy it was in the city. 
I could hear police sirens, drunks in the street, and people coming in and out of the building. Petterbury was peaceful in comparison. I kept hearing what I thought were footsteps. They didn't sound like they were coming from the stairs, though. They were soft, and there's no carpet there. Could they be coming from the hall? I didn't really think anyone was there, but I couldn't sleep and it was distracting me. I went to check. I looked up and down the hall and saw nothing like I expected to. It must be old building noise. I went to use the bathroom. After I closed the door, I heard the footsteps again. They were louder, like someone running on tiptoes. I pulled the door open but saw nothing. I turned on all the lights and checked the living room and bedroom. I was completely alone. I had to be. I was so tired, maybe I couldn't trust my senses. It all seemed very strange. I normally leave the bedroom door open, but I felt better closing it this time. It was freezing again in the morning. The boiler was off, the timer had been wiped, and the thermostat was way too low. What would make it reset like that? Oh, the weather was still terrible. I got to work on bringing things from the garage in anyway, starting with the rest of my winter clothes. One thing I found while I was shifting Pedro's computer junk out of the way was the big Matisse print we'd bought together. I'd totally forgotten about that. On our first ever date we'd gone to Tate Modern, and there'd been an exhibition of his cutout work. After we'd got engaged, we'd passed an antique store and seen an old print we remembered from the exhibition. So we bought it and replaced the frame. We were going to hang it in the living room, but somewhere along the way we decided to work abroad, so it never got hung up. I decided to surprise Pedro, show him I could complete all kinds of simple tasks without his help. I figured I'd just had enough time before going out to meet Maxi. It was pretty easy, really. I got the picture wire and spirit level from his toolbox, used the tape measure to find the exact middle of the wall, it was heavy, so it was tough to get on the hook, but it wasn't that hard, and it looked really good. I text him a picture to show off my hard work before I headed out. It was so great catching up with my sister. For some reason, I thought she might not want to talk about the baby, as she was with him all the time. But actually, that's all new parents want to talk about, because there's literally nothing else going on with them. Yes, I got to hold him and touch his tiny nose and hold his tiny hands. He was very baby-like, a good old-fashioned baby in every way. It was so weird seeing Maxie all settle down. Who knew she wanted all this domestic stuff? I mean, good for her. I just wasn't sure it was very much for me. And she had to ask, didn't she? When are you and Pedro going to have kids? Because as soon as one person has a kid... Everyone has to have one. Is it less special if you have children and everyone else doesn't? Maybe it's like getting drunk. It doesn't seem a terrible mistake if everyone does it. Once we got past that, it was a pretty good night. Not a rough night. Maxie was as tired as I was. We called it just after eleven. I was a bit tipsy, but not very drunk. And then I arrived home. I'd been robbed. I opened the door and I could see things scattered throughout the hall. The flat had been trashed. Someone had gone through every cupboard, drawer, box, container. My clothes were all over the bedroom. Some of them had been ripped up. My makeup was all over the bathroom floor. My books had been thrown across the living room. My laptop lay smashed by the dining table. And the picture I'd just hung up that afternoon was face down on the floor. I could see broken glass under it. They'd left the TV alone. I suppose that was lucky. Walked back outside and phoned the police. It was like, if I went out and then back in again, it might somehow not be as bad as it looked. Maybe I'd made some terrible mistake and it wouldn't be my flat after all. The police arrived. A man and a woman. They asked me if anything was missing. I hadn't thought to check. I'd just seen the carnage and panicked. They said to think about anything really valuable. I had my engagement ring on, I had no other expensive jewellery, and none of the rest seemed to be missing. My laptop was still there, the back was hanging off, but it still turned on. The police said they might not have found what they were looking for. But they hadn't just searched the place, they destroyed it. There were footprints on the back of the picture frame, 
Someone had literally jumped up and down on it. Someone small, said the male cop. The prints were really small. They must have had tiny feet. Did you leave the door unlocked? Asked the female cop. No, I had to unlock it to let myself in. There's no sign of forced entry. We checked it together. There was no damage to the windows either. Anyone else have a key? I shook my head, but then thought twice. What had happened to Adam and Katie's keys? Had they sent them back to us? I didn't have them, and I hadn't seen them in the flat. Could they have given them to someone else? The male cop said that if Adam and Katie had expensive things, someone might have broken in to rob them, not us. They were trying to think of a reason why we'd been targeted. If they had a key, they might have just thought, why not, said the female cop. They could have trashed the place to make sure nothing valuable was hidden. But destroying books and pictures was just vindictive. And why not take my laptop or the TV? It didn't make sense. Adam and Katie wouldn't just hand the keys over to anyone. They wouldn't be stupid like that. Or would they? How much did we really know about them? I called Pedro. I knew he'd be asleep. I just hoped he might not be. I left him a message. The cops found no fingerprints or other clues. They said that wasn't unusual. Most burglars know what they're doing. They left me with some paperwork and that was that. They recommended getting in touch with Adam and Katie. They said people desperate enough would try anything. Were they desperate? I started cleaning things up even though I was exhausted. I began with my clothes, getting them off the floor and back onto hangers. A dress I really loved had been ripped almost in half. Under that I found my signed Maya Angelou book that Pedro got me for Valentine's Day, torn up. I started to cry. Why would somebody do this? If you wanted to steal something, just steal it. Why be so fucking vicious? When I cut my hand on broken glass, I knew I had to stop. I downloaded a meditation to relax me before bed, but I was too upset. Someone had been into my home, touched my things, attacked my belongings, and maybe they had a key. When I thought of that, I got up and I dragged the drawers from my bedroom down the hall at three in the morning to block the door. I thought they might come back. Would they try again? No, it made no sense to rob me twice. I was just shaken up, afraid. I could hear footsteps in the night again. I was going to ignore them. I knew they were nothing. I heard a crack in the living room. Something being stepped on. I was out of the bed so fast. I flipped on the light and looked across the horrible mess. My eyes hurt, but no one was there again. Barely slept a wink. Pedro rang me at nine o'clock on the dot. Are you all right? I'm fine. It's shaking me up, that's all. Yeah, sure you are. Did they take anything? No, that's what's so fucked up about it. They only trashed the place. Maybe they were looking for something. That's what the police seem to think. Maybe they didn't know I'd move back in. You think they were after Adam and Katie? But why would they target me? I don't have any valuable jewellery. The police said jewellery was a better return for burglars than anything else. Did Katie have a lot of jewellery? Don't know, I said. Burglars don't pick a house at random. They choose their targets. Unless they're opportunists. Did you leave any windows open? In this weather? Well, how did they get in? That's the other fucked up thing. There's no sign of a break-in. They must have come in through the front door. Did you leave it unlocked? No, I didn't leave it unlocked. Are you sure? Yes. I had to unlock it to let myself in. How else could they get in? If you'll let me finish a fucking thought, Pedro, I'll tell you how I think they got in. Okay, okay, I'm listening. What did Adam and Katie do with their keys to the place? They said they'd post them when they left. Well, I haven't seen them. Are you sure? If he asked that again, I was going to lose it. They weren't here when I got back. Did you check the mail? Of course I checked the mail. Doesn't make sense. Why would they come back? Why trash our place? Maybe it's not them. Maybe somebody stole the keys from them. Why? Because they thought we had something worth stealing. Christ, Pedro, I don't fucking know. I'm going to change my flight. You don't have to do that. I'm worried. I want to be there with you. Pedro. I don't need you to come to my rescue. This is a shitty thing to happen, but I can take care of it. I can catch an early flight. It's, it's not a problem. 
You're only there four more days. Just wait, okay? If you want to help, find Adam and Katie's number and ask them what they did with the spare key. I have their emails. We must have their number somewhere. Phone, email, just find out, okay? I promised Pedro I'd call a locksmith. Maybe this had nothing to do with Adam and Katie's key. Lots of people had lived in the flat before us. Perhaps one of them had a key and took a chance on finding something to steal. It was as good an answer as any. I went to make myself a tea before jumping in the shower. As the kettle started to boil, I opened the cupboard to grab a mug. It was full of saucepans. I remember just staring at them for quite a long time. I was so confused. This was wrong. I'd moved the saucepans into the cupboard under the sink, and I put the mugs back in the cupboard above the kettle. I hadn't imagined this. I'd done this less than 48 hours ago. How the fuck had the cups ended up back under the sink and the saucepans in the cupboard above the kettle? I made the switch again, righting the wrong while the kettle went cold. Maybe I'd just thought to do it, and had naturally done it. I needed my shower. Standing in hot water would make me feel better and soothe my aching head. I could handle this, whatever the fuck it was that was going on. After ten calming minutes, I stepped out the shower. I wrapped myself in a towel, then stepped on some lipsticks. They slid from under my foot and I fell hard. Full legs up, arms in the air hard. My right foot kicked the door frame. It was so painful. I had, like, a real moment there where I just... I had to let myself lose it. For a few moments, I let myself scream and cry. I could have tidied the bathroom floor up last night, but didn't. I was just shit out of luck. When I was done, I sat up. I stared at my foot, wiggled my toes. Nothing was broken, it was just going to swell up and hurt like hell. I could imagine the silent judgement on Pedro's face. It was a look that said, You should have picked those things up already, shouldn't you? Well, I picked myself up and I hopped myself about. I put on my pyjamas, made that cup of tea, sat on the sofa and sandwiched my foot between a bag of ice and frozen green beans. I was desperate to tidy up all the fucking mess, but there was just nothing I could do for now. I had to try and relax. I let the TV play whatever crap was on for a couple of hours. My laptop was working, but the Wi-Fi was fucked. Finding a locksmith was not easy on my phone. Their website's not great on mobile. Why was everything such a fucking nightmare? Calling them out fast would cost a fortune, and I didn't even have a job yet. When was I even going to get around to that? What would Pedro do? Would he spend the money on getting one fast, or would he wait? It was unlikely that they'd come back already having found nothing, so I made the appointment for a few days' time. The second thoughts came straight away. I could keep blocking the door, leave the key in the lock, but I wouldn't be here all the time. What about when I was out? Could I even drag the drawers back to the door with my ankle in such a state? Ah, to hell with it. I decided now. Pedro would be back soon anyway. Not that I needed him to look after me. It would just be nice not to be alone. I went on Facebook. I was trying to make plans to meet up with people. I thought that after a year away, my friends might be excited to see me. But everyone was busy. They'd all got plans already, or lived far away, or they got kids to look after now. So many baby photos in my feed. I thought about messaging Maxie to let her know what had happened. But there was nothing she could really do. She had enough on her plate, and I was going to be fine. I decided to look up Adam and Katie. I was wondering if they were the people we thought they were. What if they were druggies who'd come back hoping to find money? That would explain a lot. Aussies do like to live large. Couldn't find Katie at all. Adam's feed was pretty empty. It just had things shared with him by friends, memes and stuff. There was one thing from a few months ago. A picture of the two of them on a bright day in the park. They were holding hands with a little girl and lifting her up off the ground. Everyone was grinning, having a great old time. The picture had a few likes from members of his family, judging by the names. The girl wasn't tagged. She was maybe six or seven. There was something a little off about the photo. She looked a bit weird, 
though the flash had gone off too close to her, except that it was sunny so they wouldn't have used flash, unless by accident. She couldn't have been their kid. They'd have mentioned that, right? Plus she looked mixed race, and Adam and Katie are both white. The picture stuck in my head enough to ask Pedro about it. I'm pretty sure they'd have said if they had kids. But they didn't say for definite that they didn't have kids, I said. Yeah, but no one would come to you and say, Hi, nice to meet you. Me and my partner don't have children. That would be weird. Besides, they would have to have told us because of the contract. But the picture is really weird. And I just remembered something. You know, I texted you about putting the Matisse print up. That was pulled off the wall and someone jumped on the back. You can see tiny footprints there. You think kids did this? A kid, maybe? I don't know. I thought you said the girl was really young. Yeah, I guess it doesn't make sense that a kid or kids could do this on their own. Have you seen Home Alone? He was poking fun at me and I didn't like it. And I got the feeling he was doing it because there was something he wanted to say but couldn't spit it out. Are you still there? I asked. I was just thinking something. And? Are you sure you didn't just leave the door unlocked? I felt my fist clench. I told you I didn't leave the door unlocked. It would just make sense. None of this makes sense. Why target us in the first place? It's opportunism. If you leave the door unlocked, I got ready to let rip. You do sometimes forget to do things, he continued. I told you. I let myself in through the front door and it was locked. Are you sure you're remembering things right? Yes, I remember perfectly. Because this whole thing with the cupboard, you said you weren't sure about that either. The thing with the cupboard is... I felt myself start to tear up. Really fucking weird. I can't remember what I did and didn't do with that. But I know the door was locked. I have never gone out and left the door unlocked. Ever. Not once. The voice was cracking. Maybe I should just come home early. I said no. I've looked at the tickets. The prices for tomorrow aren't so bad. That's not the point. I don't need you to come here and help me out. You think I'm so helpless, but you're wrong. I don't know what happened, but it's not my fault. I didn't say it was. Basically, you did. You said I left the door unlocked. You don't have any faith in me. I do have faith in you. Then fucking trust me. I may not be good at programming boilers or fixing computers, but I can look after myself. I don't need you to fly in like a superhero. I could look after myself before you showed up in my life, and I can still look after myself now. I don't need you, Pedro. He went silent for a moment. Maybe I went too far. If you say so, but I'm looking at Adam's Facebook now, and there's no sign of any picture of them with a child. I'm not making this up. It was from a few months ago. I have his feed open right now and there's no picture. They were both in the photo. I mean, all three of them. Check if you don't believe me. I don't believe you and I am going to check. The conversation ended. I scrolled like crazy on my phone trying to find a picture. I checked my search history. I got so frustrated. I almost threw my phone at the wall. There was no picture. Pedro had another reason to think I was losing it. Pedro had heard nothing back from Adam or Katie. Didn't they want their deposit back? On impulse, I sent a message to Adam via messenger. I wrote, Hi, we need to talk. Ping me when you get this message, thanks. You'd expect someone to get back to you quickly with a message like that. I limped to the bathroom for a blanket. There was one in the wardrobe. I'd given up on the heating. Every time I set the timer, it reset again. Somehow Pedro's golf clubs had survived the burglary untouched, despite being probably the priciest thing in the flat. I thought about bashing them out of shape. I could blame it on the burglars. I messaged Maxie after all. I sent her a message just saying, Hi, how's your head? But she didn't message me back. I fell asleep on the sofa in the afternoon. I'd hardly slept for days. When I woke up, it was dark. There were no lights on in the flat. I lifted up my phone to check the time, but the battery was dead. My head was groggy and my neck was stiff, but I knew something wasn't right. There was some light coming from somewhere. I heard the front door creak. I jumped to my feet and almost fell over my fucking ankle. I got into the hall, trying to ignore the pain. The light was coming from the corridor outside. The front door was wide open. I shot a look from side to side, from the kitchen to the bedroom. Was someone here? Had they left? 
Had I really left the fucking door unlocked this time? Had it fallen open? Couldn't see anyone. And I couldn't see any new carnage. I just left the bathroom to check. I took a deep breath and hopped over. I grabbed onto the door frame and looked inside. It was empty too. I looked down the hall and out the front door. I could hear muffled noises from somewhere. Hello? I asked. No one answered. I limped further right up to the doorway. I stuck my head around and looked down the corridor. I still couldn't see anyone. The light was motion sensitive. Someone must have come in or out in the last few minutes. I hopped out. I looked up the stairs looking for someone, anyone. There was the faint sound of people somewhere higher up in the building. The door slammed shut behind me. Before I could reach for the handle, I heard the click of the lock. No! 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 I banged on the door, hopelessly twisted the handle. It wouldn't budge! Through the panes of frozen glass, I watched a figure slowly stand and show their face. For a silent moment, I stared into the eyes of a little girl. Her head was bent up from the neck as she tried to make herself taller. I could see dark, long hair, but the rest of her features were blurred. Let me in, I pleaded. I banged on the windows on the frame. She watched me until I stopped. Then she turned away and walked down the hall. Who are you, I shouted. What are you doing? I kicked the door and regretted it. I shrieked in pain, stumbled back against the wall opposite. I slid to the floor and put my head between my legs. I started to cry. The motion-sensitive light went out, leaving me in the dark. I was locked out, with no phone, no way to reach anyone, tripped by some psycho schoolchild who somehow had keys to my flat. How did she get here? What was she doing? Did she really think she could keep me out? What was I going to do? I was in my fucking pyjamas. I could break a pane of glass, but I couldn't unlock the door unless she'd left the key in the lock. And that's if I could reach down far enough. I either had to start knocking on doors and beg for help, or limp outside to find a phone box. The first option was just about better, assuming anyone was home. I heard the clunk sound of the building's front door open. The lights came back on. I got myself up and tried to shout out, but the pain of putting weight back on my foot cut me short. Their footsteps were moving quickly. I stumbled to the stairs and shouted, Hey, hello! I heard shopping bags being dropped. I grabbed onto the stair handrail and dragged myself up one step at a time. I loudly, desperately shouted, Help me! The footsteps sped up. They were heading towards me. I pulled myself onto the landing, sliding across the floor as I let go of the handrail. It was the Puerto Rican lady I used to know. She bent down to me, saying, My goodness, what happened? I locked myself out. I hurt my foot. Tears were running down my face. Oh, poor thing, she said. She bent down and helped lift me onto my good foot. It looks swollen bad. I kicked a door. It really hurts. I felt like a child pleading with my mum. You come with me, I can help you. I managed to thank her between the sobs. She walked me to her front door, thankfully on the ground floor. I didn't know you would come back. You've been gone a long while. I nodded. You've been teaching abroad. There was a complex shifting of limbs as she reached for her keys and unlocked the door while trying to keep me upright. We went into her kitchen. She sat me down by her breakfast table and got down to her knees to check my ankle. She was a nurse. I'd forgotten. Can you wiggle your toes? I nodded and sniffed. You poor thing, she said. She passed me some kitchen rolls so I could blow my nose. What happened to you? What could I say about the girl and the burglary and all that other strange shit? And what wouldn't open a whole can of follow-up questions and make me sound like I was fucking crazy? I just said that. The door closed behind me. Something in my gut was making me doubt some ordinary kid could be in my home. Sure, she could be real. She could be some evil genius who knew where we lived had the keys and kept finding a way in. But did that make any sense? Did any of this? I was saved from saying anything else when a cat pounced on the table. Curious, he walked right to the edge and sized me up. Alfie, you're not supposed to be on the table. My neighbour scooped him up. He's not trained yet. You're very naughty, aren't you? She placed him in his basket. He defiantly leapt right out and darted down the hall. 
gave me something to smile about. How long have you been back? Just a few days. And what happened to those two who were there before? I forgot their names. Adam and Casey. Oh, they were nice people. I didn't respond. Did you talk to them much? I asked. I saw them around. They helped me look for my cat when he went missing. Oh, oh, did he disappear? She saw me glancing down the hall for Alfie. Oh no, Alfie's my new one. We never found Buddy. He just disappeared. I I don't know what happened, she said sadly. Oh, I'm sorry. I remember the poster by the post cubbies. Worst things happen. Maybe he's happy somewhere. Would you like some water? Yes, please. Then I asked, did you see Adam and Katie with a child at all? Hmm? A kid. Did they ever have a child with them? Oh, yes, yes. They had that little girl. What was her name? They said she was her cousin. She was a precious thing. Did you see her a lot? A few times, yes. She was with them a long time, I think. So shy. I thought maybe she was a bit special. When I said hello, she wouldn't even look at me. She asked, did they leave a mess behind? Oh no, it's just that me and Pedro didn't know that they had someone staying with them. They should have said but didn't. She passed me a mug of tap water. How is Pedro? She asked, beaming. He's fine, thanks. Obviously a fan. Look at me, talking and talking. We need to find you some help. I guess we can find a lock person online. Yes, thank you. If you have a computer or a phone, I can call someone. Such a nightmare. We have to do it quick, though. I'm on the late shift. I need to go quite soon. What time is it? I had absolutely no idea. It's after 10pm. I just came back with the shopping and to feed Alfie. Oh, and I left it outside. She went out to fetch it in. I tried to think things through. A little girl who was shy and liked to hide. Although she wasn't being quiet any more. Now she was being vicious and vindictive. I suddenly understood why the TV and Pedro's stupid golf clubs had survived the flat trashing. They were in the flat when Adam and Katie lived there. Only the new things that I bought in were destroyed. And it's why I had saucepans in the cupboard for cups. She was putting things back to how they were. Getting back at me for coming back to my own home. I started to tremble. It was obvious she was no ordinary girl. She couldn't be. I could imagine Pedro rolling his eyes. You can't be serious. You think we have a ghost? Or just you fucking try and explain what's going on, Pedro. You have a real good go, because I am all out of ideas. You don't just leave a girl behind in a flat when you move out. And she's been there the whole time. All those times I'd heard footsteps in the night. She was probably fucking with the thermostat too, just to piss me off. My neighbour came back in. Let me get these things in the freezer and we can find help for you. She put down the bags, then reached for something under her arm. I grabbed your post for you, she said, dropping a jiffy bag on the table in front of me. The bag landed on the table with a little metallic thud. Just from that, I guessed what it might be. I tore off the top. The spare key slid right out. Where did they come from? she asked. They posted them back after all, I said. There was nothing else in the packet. The stamp on the envelope was second class. It must have been in the post for days. The girl really had been in the flat the whole time. I should have been over the moon. But I was afraid to go back. I didn't know what was waiting for me. And I didn't want to do it alone. Will you help me back downstairs? I asked. If she saw I was scared, she didn't mention it. She won't be down the stairs right up to the door. I was worried the girl might have left the key in the lock to stop me, but the spare slid right in and turned just as expected. I opened the door and stood waiting for her. Nothing happened. Well there, all's well. You put that foot back on ice. It'll get better soon. My neighbour was already heading up the stairs. When's your shift over? I asked quickly. Oh, seven o'clock. It's the worst one. Hope it goes quick, I said, lump in my throat. I took a deep breath, limped inside, closed the door gently. Are you there? I said. I'm not here to hurt you, I just... What was I going to say? Tough luck, this is my home now. 
Get the hell out. I turned on the lights to every room. I checked each one for signs of her. She must have gone back into hiding. I went to the living room. I was feeling a little relieved until I saw one of my sketch pads open on the dining room table. My colour pencils were scattered across the tabletop. She'd made me a sketch. It was a childish picture of a bedroom. There was a man and a woman standing by the door. Their faces were blank, with no features. There was a very long bed with someone lying down on it. A little girl was on top of them. She had a big grin. She was smothering them with a pillow. Before I could scream, I heard the toilet flush. I went fast as I could to the bathroom. Then I screamed. My phone was in the toilet. I tried to rescue it. It was stuck at the bottom, too large to get around the U-bend. I pulled it out, dripping wet. But that wasn't the worst part. The back had come off. The SIM and battery were gone. All my phone numbers were gone. She was cutting me off. First the internet, now my phone. I heard the click of the lock on the front door. I went to the hall. She was there, locking the door. Locking me in. She turned to face me. Normal little girls don't look like that. Her eyes were empty black. Her face contorted, it stretched. She screamed and I felt it in every bone of my body. I ran for the bedroom. She dived at me, grabbed hold of my pyjama bottoms. She pulled them down as she dropped to the floor, tripping me up and bringing me down with her. I pulled my legs out of them. I leapt on all fours through the bedroom doorway. I swiveled on my butt and I slammed the door behind me. Wincing in pain, I put my back up against it. She hammered on the door with her fists, kicking and screaming. I put my fingers in my ears, but I could still hear her. Get out! Get out! Get out! Over and over. She wasn't giving up. She wasn't stopping. She wasn't getting tired. She screeched and kicked and yelled for so long. I had to start screaming just to block out the noise. I don't know how long this went on for. I was screaming my throat raw before I realised she'd stopped. I coughed and retched for a time after. What I would have given to drink something. But I didn't dare move. I was trapped with no way out and no way to get help. She had all the keys now. Could I make it through the window? We were in the basement. The windows didn't open out far, and even if I could crawl out, a wire mesh covered the alcoves at ground level. I'd have to be away from the door for longer than I dared, and I couldn't even walk properly. I heard things crashing and breaking. She was going crazy, taking apart anything and everything she hadn't already destroyed. I covered my ears again. You'd think someone from the building would come down and check what was going on. Someone must be hearing all this. You'd come and check, right? What was wrong with people? I had my head between my legs until all the noise stopped. After that, I lay on my side. I was too afraid to move. I lay there for hours, waiting, scared to allow the door to open an inch. I listened so carefully for sounds of where she was. How quietly could I move? Could I make it over to Pedro's golf clubs before she realised I wasn't by the door? Were they a good enough weapon? I had to do something. I slowly let the pressure off the door. There was no sound, no change. I crawled on all fours across the carpet to the closet. I opened it up, stood up and pulled out a club with a heavy but pointed head. I tiptoed painfully back to the door and listened carefully. There were no new sounds. By now it was almost sunrise. The sky was turning pale yellow. That made me feel safer. Ghosts in the daylight. Had I seen or heard anything from her during the day? But we were in the basement. It never really got a lot of light. I needed to drink something so badly. I gave it a little longer, letting some more daylight pour in. I slowly pushed down the door handle, letting it pop open. I looked through the crack, ready to slam it shut in an instant. I could see into the living room. She'd torn the dining room table apart and smashed all the chairs. Nothing had escaped her wrath this time. Pull the door open further, clutching the golf club tightly. I limped slowly into the hall, still safe. No sign down the hall or in the kitchen. I hopped to the bathroom. 
She looked to be gone for now. In the living room, the TV was face down on the floor. She'd torn up the couch as well. Chunks of white stuffing were everywhere. I started to look around for the keys, but it seemed hopeless. They could be anywhere. Even the carpet had taken a shredding. Snapped pieces of the dining chairs had torn into the surface, making rips short and long. There was a big tear where the carpet touched the metal divider in the doorway. The corner of the tear was folded over. And I could see something under there. I got on my knees and lifted the flap all the way over, tearing it back even further. Something was painted under it, on the floorboards. There were jagged lines, scratched into the wood. After downing pints of water, I got to work. I slid my swollen foot in a slipper to make it easier to put weight on it. I dragged the furniture and other debris across the living room, piling everything up on one side of the room. With everything broken into pieces, it was an easy job, and it was too late to care about damaging anything. The sun came up, and I was breaking a sweat, even though the flat was colder than ever. I was more exhausted than ever. I wondered if I was hallucinating the whole thing. I pulled up the carpet, going along each wall, ripping it back from under the skirting. An odour rose from the floorboards. I knew that smell. It was that same musty scent I'd noticed when I moved back in. I lifted the carpet over the broken furniture pile, revealing just over half of the floorboards. I was standing in the middle of some kind of circle. Something occult. The circles were drawn in a dark ink. They were as wide as the room. There were two outer circles, one inside the other, with a small gap between the two. Two long lines crossed the circle, going from north to south, east to west. They were crossed in the middle, where there was a small third circle. It was like the centre of a target. Between the two outer circles, there was an insane amount of scratched, jagged lines cut into the floor. They looked frantic. There was no pattern to them. I looked closely at them and saw what looked like words or symbols underneath. I don't think I could have read them even if I could have made them out. There were no letters I recognised. In the centre, in that small circle, there was a dark patch. Some kind of stain dried into the wood. I had the terrible feeling it was not red wine. The whole room stunk. The fuck had they done? Whatever they'd brought back, they hadn't been able to control it or get rid of it. They tried to destroy the words, but the spirit had stayed. They just covered up their work and run away, leaving me with whatever was here now. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. She was right behind me. She cast no shadow, but I knew she was there. The golf club was just inches away, leaning against the wall. I made for it. I swung it around and smashed the wedge against her eye socket. Flecks of blood hit my cheek. The blow lifted her off her feet. She flew back and slid across the floor like a doll. I stood holding the club up, waiting for her to come at me. She just lay there, doing nothing. Fear overwhelmed me. She was a child. What had I done? I dropped the club and went to her, getting down and leaning over her body. She looks so normal now. A tiny, ordinary girl with an eye bleeding horribly. I was about to shake her awake, say sorry and beg forgiveness. Her unmarked eyes sprung open. Her mouth opened. She shrieked, lashed out with her left hand and clawed her fingers across my cheek. She dug her hands into me. Tearing and ripping at my top, I put my hands around her neck and closed them tight. I gripped hard and pressed down. I felt her shake and struggle under me. She scratched and pulled at my hands and arms, dug her nails in, but I didn't stop. I pressed down. I tightened my grip, made it harder and harder. I was all rage, blinded by anger. I was so lost for a moment. I wasn't even there. I was somewhere else. There was no daylight, it was nearly pitch black and I wasn't strangling her. I was clutching a pillow, forcing it down on her face. 
I felt her body stop twitching. Her hands fell to her sides. She was no longer struggling. I was back in the room, but I didn't let go. I kept on, even as her face went blue and I could feel no resistance from her muscles or her bones. Only when the smell changed did I snap out of it and look up. The signs on the floor were disappearing. They dissolved into a fine dust rising into the air. The circles were fading away. I looked beneath me. There was no little girl. Just another large, dark stain on the floorboards. I picked up the golf club and stood up. My torn pyjama top was barely hanging on me. I tore it off. When it landed on the floor, I saw Pedro staring at me from the doorway, his suitcases parked by him. Despite what I'd said, he'd come back early. I stood there in my underwear, scratches across my face, holding a golf club dripping with blood, surrounded by broken furniture, a torn-up carpet, standing on a scratched-up floor, stained with two pools of dried blood. And I shouted to him, Fuck off, Pedro! I know you would have done everything differently, but I fucking handled this myself, okay? Thank you for listening to the New Ghost Stories podcast. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please give it a like or leave a review on any platform and subscribe to hear future releases. And if you want to support the podcast, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash new ghost stories. The podcast is written and produced by me, David Paul Nixon, and today's story features in the book New Ghost Stories Volume 3, which is out on October the 8th. To hear all the latest from me, sign up to my substack at davidpaulnixon.substack.com. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at New Ghost Stories and learn more at newghoststories.com. Next time on the New Ghost Stories podcast, what if a boy's imaginary friend refuses to be forgotten? The New Ghost Stories podcast is supported by Horrified the website that celebrates and champions British horror, covering films, television, books, fiction and more. You can visit Horrified at horrifiedmagazine.co.uk and find them on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at horrifiedmag.